Guys, welcome uh, to the Wine Personality Global Series. As you know, this is a program that informs, shares a lot of knowledge from people we believe are pushing the industry in Ghana and elsewhere around the world to great heights. Um, so far, we've done a lot. So far, the quote, even uh, dating back as 1959. Today we are privileged to have Mr. Samuel Obie. Obie is, a, is currently the managing director of Anubu as Chancellor of the European Mine. And as always, Sam is going to tell us a lot of stories combining his personal and professional experiences so that we believe people will uh, emulate these experiences as part of the wider sustainability of the industry. Thank you very much for having Sam. Welcome, Lawrence. It's been a while, isn't it? Yes, it has been. Um, you may want to tell us a little about background. And then, how did you get interested in the mining industry in the first place? Okay, so uh, thanks, Lawrence. And by the way, I might say that you, you're doing a good job. Um, you and your team. I've been following you guys up sometimes whilst I'm in Australia. And I think. Um, the way this thing started and where it's been able to, um, where, where you've gotten with this thing, I think it requires a lot of tenacity. Yeah. Well done uh, to you and your team. Look, I think um, it's, it's really interesting for me because when I was in school, um, most of the courses that you hear is electrical engineering yes. um, or mechanical yeah. or chemical engineering, civil. And everyone was looking at tech. Um, so for some of us, that was a dream for every science student to go to tech and do um, an engineering course. Ironically, I had two courses in mind. One was chemical engineering and mechanical engineering. But I think after school, um, whilst I, we were waiting, I think during our time, you have to wait for almost two years or one yes. year before you, uh, the results comes in, yeah. apply, and I think there's this entrance exam that you have to do. Um, so during that period, I went to visit my dad, and I had, I had two people, one of them said to a friend, and two elderly people, and, and one of them said to the other, if your son graduates from secondary school, what course are you going to let him do? And he said, I'm going to let him do mining, <laughs> mining engineering. After that, he will go and work in Obuasi and make more money. By then, I needed more money, so I thought that was a good deal. So I started asking a question, mining engineering, mining engineering, what's it about? And then, so I went home, asked a friend, a very close friend of mine, and he said, oh, mining engineering is in Takwa. So that's the first time I even heard about School of Mines. And so, he happened to um, say, oh, I know a friend who went to Augustine's with me, who is at the School of Mines at the moment, uh, by then School of Mines, now you, Matt. Um, and I said, can we go and have a talk with him? Guess who he was? Frederick Mum. <laughs> so I'm sure if Frederick is listening, uh, it will be one of the starting points for me to yeah. know more about mine. And then uh, he opened up, told me more about mine, and, and all that I wanted to hear is that it, it involved calculation because I, I, I did like maths and, yes. and calculation, so he said it involved calculation. Yeah. So I applied for School of Mines and that's how I entered into the mining industry. And I think so far, I think it's been good for me. Um, it's been a yeah, good change. it's actually been good. Um, I know since 2002, when you complete, you've moved on to several places, like Tanzania, Australia, even Ghana, everywhere. Moved nicely as well. Frankly, you know, if one would have said as you put a bet on whether I'll get this far, I wouldn't probably have said yes. Um, but I think it's it's a matter of interest in the industry when you enter and the opportunities that comes your way and how you exploit them. I've always been contrarian. 
Okay, I've always had a different way of looking at things, um, and those who know me in school of mine, very smallish, but like to argue every point, for sometimes for argument's sake, but I think I always see things a bit different, and I like challenges. So when I did my service in Bogoso, um, I think by then there was a lot of, uh, you know, there was a lot of opportunities there. Yes, that time. Yeah, um, one person that I think did very, did really in, um, help me during that national service was a, a man called um, Indigo Say, yeah. our chief. I think he really brought most of the things that I didn't quite understand because to me that was the first time working in a mine. Yeah. Even as that, um, you know, you might I never got the opportunity to go on any. Yes. Um, visit we did, but to do attachment or what, anything like that. So most of the theory and the transition to the practical aspect was was quite difficult. Comprehending this thing in classroom. So I think, and, and frankly, I am sold on the fact that no one should graduate from school of mines having visited any mine, any any um, mine or done internship before. I, I think we should help as an industry to drive that. You know, we can't have all these mines around Goldfields, Takwa, Goda Mine, uh, Idraprim, Bogoso, Wasa Mine, and so, Obuasi, and so. And somebody really graduates from UMAT and hasn't really done anything like that. That's, so, so that's where it started, you know. Um, I now started closing in the, um, the practical and the theory. And then I began liking mining. I was like, okay, now these things are connecting. I'm connecting the dots. It's making sense for me. And then from there, um, I didn't get opportunity to work um, in the mine because I think uh, they didn't pick any any of the national service personnel. So we, except one person who was um, Emmanuel Edwinchi uh, in geology, he got opportunity because. Um, um, someone by then um, had gotten an opportunity to go and do masters in US, so he got opportunity for him to. But the rest of us, really, all of us went home. And during that time, um, I happened to get opportunity to work for a company called Boskudos. And our first operation was in the drop room. So I came here with a contractor as a, a project engineer. Um, and then working as a contractor for a Drapri mine um, for some time, and then got opportunity to go to uh, Goldfields, um, and then from Goldfields went to DR Congo, um, and from Congo to Australia to work for BHP. And ever since I've been in Australia um, for the past 14 years, even though I've been exporting from Australia to other African countries, but. That has been home for me for the past 14 years. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot you can choose from. Look, very lot. Strategic planning manager, technical services, uh, general manager, managing director. There's a lot. But what are at least three of the most important highlights in your career? I think the first one for me, the key one was working as strategic planning engineer at Goldfields. Okay. I think that's the starting point. Yes. Okay. That was the point, that was a time that maybe a lot of people saw the potential in me, especially my managers. Um, so Goldfields really taught me a lot. Goldfields, during our time in Goldfields, it was more like a, a training school, you know. So you go there and there's a lot of experience and a lot to learn in Goldfields. Working as a strategic planning engineer and um, my manager by then, I always tell the young guys, had 20 years experience and I thought that was an opportunity to tap into, into his learning. Okay. So I think sooner than later, um, within two years, I probably gained the experience of somebody who has about five years experience because of the questioning style yes. that I normally use. I, pra I can't learn by telling me, do we this, this, this and that. I learn by questioning. Why do we do it this way? Why do we get it done this way? So I think uh, Dean Reynolds, um, he's now in the US. I'm sure by now he's retired. But well done, Dean, if you, 
if you happen to listen to this um, you know interview um, I think you did a very good job with my career you gave me a lot of opportunities and you taught me a lot so Dean practically poured about 20 years worth of experience in me within a short period of time gave me the opportunity to step up and Gary Chapman as well um, has always believed in developing talent you know I, I also went and worked with him at um, um, in Tanzania uh, so Gary Chapman Dean Reynolds um, really gave me the opportunity learned a lot from them and then um, you know based on that I could easily go and be an expert um, and still deliver uh, good, uh, good, um, good work as an expert there as well. That's I'm, I'm trying to look at something here. Look, you've done a lot of movements. Movements to highlights. What was the motivation? What was the inspiration? What was the motivation? If I was with the inspiration. Well, I always... Yeah, just leaving some like, what was your strengths? I mean, it's, 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 it's well, my, I, I personally feel that my strength is in my mindset. My mindset is quite strong, um, very determined, you know. If I set myself to do something, it's not easy that I'll give up. It might take some time, but I'll still um, come to it. I believe in what I do, and I believe in what opportunity, uh, goals that I set in my, for myself. And I don't look down on myself. I, I, I don't, I'm not a type that will see an opportunity and say, this one is for so, so, and so. Sometimes I think that's one of the things um, that draws us back as Ghanaians. Very competent people, experienced people, educated people. <clears throat> but sometimes when an opportunity comes, we are quick to think that as for this rule, is for Joe Bloke or it's for another person so we don't even give it a try okay i'm not that type i think i will put my hand for a rule that i believe that i can do um, and not because i want the rule but i'm i'm confident that i have the capability to do uh, if you start thinking that the rule will be given to lawrence therefore i'm not going to apply you should change yourself okay leave that decision to the person going to make the decision okay don't try and solve the person's puzzles for him. Okay. Yeah. Just put your CV in, and, and, and that to me has been the issue. If I see opportunity and I think I can do the role, I just put my CV in. And I go for interview, the person making the decision realizes that, no, there's more to this young man than um, what it is. Several people have interviewed me, and then they see me physically and say, is it, are you the one? You." <laughs> You know, they were expecting to see someone um, really huge or whatever be the case. But I be confidence in yourself. Believe that you can get it done. You know, never assume that the role is meant for somebody. You might have hypothesis that uh, yeah, this role has always been for that person. And that was one of the things that stagnated most of our, uh, most of the Ghanaians. Um, we always thought this role is meant for an expatriate. Okay. If we don't, nowadays I think with the hard work that has happened, we don't have such issues at the yeah. moment. Um, it, it's not that much compared to maybe 14, 15 years ago. It was crazy. Every, almost every HOD on every mine was an expert. Okay. Um, and that's because even if the opportunity comes, we don't put our hand up that we can do it. And therefore, nobody is going to call you. We want someone to call us and say, hey, Lawrence, come, we'll give you this rule. It normally doesn't happen that way, you know. We need to showcase ourselves. And, and that's one thing that I've tried to do um, and, and sold myself um, as well. Um, because I have this sort of metrics that I have, that there is that which you know that others know that is your strength. There is that which you do not know, but others know, okay? That is your blind side, okay? And that blind side is quite important for you to get feedback from managers or friends to tell you those ones. But there's something that you know, but the others don't know. 
that one you can only close the gap by selling yourself put your hand up when an opportunity comes and say i can do this um put your cv in and i think you know there will always be an opportunity for for anyone who is determined yeah yes, me have some believes that we need to learn by person. We need to critique always and pick the opportunities out of the notes. We also need to build a strong mindset. As a professional, be determined and don't give up in anything you are faced with. I mean, for some, it's all about empowering yourself. Your current role is with What are you going to achieve with it as far as it's not in the Look, if you look at my profile, the gap between becoming the general manager technical services for Resolute and taking up this role is very short. I think it's just about seven months. Um, and at Resolute, lead, some of the leadership were not happy that I was leaving that quick. But the decision was to come back and make an impact. Okay. So when I was approached for this role, that was one of the things on my mind um, as at that time, that how do I come back home and, 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 and make an impact? So definitely from the onset, making an impact in the community, um, among the workforce, providing leadership is something that is much, much more dear to um, what I intend to achieve. Okay. <clears throat> So it, it's 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 what has driven me to um, to this to pick to pick up this role and and come back home. How do we? I one of the things that I I as I indicated earlier on. How do we make sure that the young guys that are in school are getting the experience that they they need? Okay. Um, in this role, I can make that impact. Okay. Um, the communities that we operate in, how do we make a difference? Um, Ghana has been mining for some time. The, um, the, the communities don't normally see the value, uh, even though we're doing a lot. I think, you know, having been back home, if I look at some of the things that have been done by the mining companies, I think we, we've, gone, we've gone far better. We, we've, we've improved in the way we do things. There's a, a fair bit of work that the mining companies have been able to um, um, nail down. So those are the things that, um, and then people development, coaching and helping others. Because I think there are 1,001 more Samuel Pobis around. Yeah. It's just that sometimes they are not given the opportunity or we haven't identified them to, um, to give them those opportunity. <coughs> And we as Ghanaians who have been in the industry for some time should be able to take people up and mentor them and, and bring them up because in the end, I'm not going to be in this seat forever yeah. or even in the industry forever. Yeah. People will take over. What, what sort of legacy do we want to leave behind or what sort of coaching and direction do we want them to drive this industry? If we don't start putting those pegs on the ground now, it might be too late and this is the time that we can bring some of the knowledge from wherever we've worked in Australia, in other parts of the world uh, and, and impact it um, in, in the industry. And, and that's the crust of the reason why uh, I came back and what I'm trying to achieve in this role as well. Look, if you look at most of the mines, um, that is the big players, most of them are listed, so there are some level of regulatory requirement that is required of them. So in terms of standard, we, we say, I can say that uh, most of the big players are aligned mostly with international standards, whether you talk about AGA, which the company that I work for, uh, which I'm proud of. 
um, New Moon, Goldfields, and all the others. I think they are. They we doing a good job to comply with international yeah, standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the other players, I think, as a matter of time, they will be able to learn from the big players. You know, the good thing is that the good the big players should set the example or the tone for the the smaller players to emulate um, those examples. Um, and so, if you ask me, standard wise, are we like the developed countries in terms of um, those that are mining in the developed countries? Um, probably they don't have the same complexities that we have. Okay, so you know, and and most mines in that part of the world might not be doing significant portion of the things, the social interventions that we do, so forth and so on. Given the fact that. We have a much more complex environment and a lot of stakeholders that we deal with. So from that perspective, I will, I will rank most of the players within the sub-region as doing a lot of um, good job, uh, at least for the past five years. Social intervention, providing um, school blocks, health facilities, drinking water, um, educating, malaria campaign, um, and so forth and so on. Which in other jurisdiction will normally be handled by and uh, the government yeah. you know we we step in we yes. partner with government to the, to to bring about some of these improvement projects because of the environment that we operate in to leave our communities better off um, than what how we met them and most of the times I mean, uh, there has been a lot of uh, emerging technologies in the system we see mines with driverless trucks, mines with a lot of automated systems, right? Um, looking at the system now, as here as we speak, the current system is in the country. Um, have we embraced the many technologies fully? I, I don't think we've got in there yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like technology and all this automation stuff, um, but I think in certain environment it works. Okay. In our, I have been involved in justifying some of this automation um, and and so forth and so on, especially in the about ten ten years ago, uh, it was some something that was coming up. Um, but I think you see in Australia that makes sense because the labor cost is expensive. In fact, most of the things that drove most of the Australians, my whether it into a BHP into automation, was labor cost. I remember in those times, I mean, truck drivers um, were just changing location of of the uh, uh, of the companies they work for without necessarily changing their lifestyle. Okay, and then and and then labor cost was skyrocketing, moving up and up. So it makes sense for you to invest in that huge infrastructure to bring about automation, because if you look at the trend, if you don't get a way of doing that. So in Australia environment, it, it's, it works, maybe in US and other places because of the, the labor cost. In Africa or in Ghana, um, I think we can't make a business proposition for it, unless we bring it in as a strategic advantage. And most of the time, you, you justify this thing on efficiencies, okay? But the percentage of efficiency that you probably will get compared to the percentage increase in cost, because these things come with certificated labor, yeah. Yeah. you probably will have a lot of experts yes. uh, yeah. coming on board yeah. that are much more expensive, yeah. maybe 10 times or 5 times expensive yeah. like you're going to get. So it's difficult for operations within Africa to make a value proposition around such things. Is it going to happen? Yes, I think it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Okay. Um, as our labor force become more uh, educated, skilled oriented, um, we will gradually see that these things will start crippling in. But I think give ourselves the next 10 years, we'll start seeing most of this um, automation. When I was working in Resolute, um, Siama Mine had 
but when I got there, they started this automation program. And, and sooner than later, it was taken off because of the fact that mostly the efficiencies that probably they were expecting was not happening in the cost. We had a lot of SPAC that were running this thing. So that really defeated the purpose, so to say, and made the business case very difficult to continue um, justifying. And what did we do? We came back to um, using the labor and, and driving uh, the thing manually. So it makes sense in some jurisdiction, given the business case in this part of the world, probably we need to give ourselves some time, but it's definitely going to be a game changer in, um, in as these mines are becoming deeper. Um, it might get to a point whereby the economics of it and the benefits might probably force us to make that decision. Um, because see, when you're running this track on algorithm, then you can be minimizing your ramp width because the tendency of them colluding, uh, colliding against each other or scratching themselves is minimized. And minimizing your width, the width of the ramp, um, by even 10 meters is a significant amount of stripping from the top. Imagine you, you, have, um, you have to strip about, like this mine, you have to do about almost 150 to 160 uh, meters deep to come into the hole. And you're saving about 10 meters of ramp width. You know, the stripping minimizes uh, significantly, you know. So as mines get deep and we start looking at all these other technologies, I think it will start making sense for us to, or, uh, or there will be enough business relevance for it that the labor cost will not be um, that much to uh, defeat that purpose. So, um, look, you've, you've, you've personally seen it all, you know, from mine planning to creations, results, and then to stats. Uh, my first of all, I want to, most people just believe that, look, let them do it. Do you believe in um, getting your hands dirty and getting down to the first principles in your yeah. One thing Dean Reynolds taught me is that you can't go be a good planner without understanding the deposit. That's true. <clears throat> okay. Very true. So Dean was always very um, interested in understanding, sitting down with the Jews to understand the deposit. Okay. And I think it's something that I picked up. That would be one of the reasons why I even decided to pursue a master's in Jew stars. Okay. Because whilst you do the mind planning and stuff, it's really, um, you know, what we mining companies really invest in is the deposit. What we buy is the deposit. Any other um, facility is just a derivative of the deposit. Okay. So if you don't understand the deposit really, the chances of you making wrong investment is high. Okay. So whether it is the plant, the plant is configured to the deposit. Fleet size is configured to the deposit. So I, I think that is one of the things that I'm sold on and therefore I, I, I try to spend more time understanding that um, the deposit and to all the planners out there, it's all these things put together. So um, coming back to the key point about um, what is really driving my interest and and uh, operations gets my hands dirty and so forth and so on practically you need to get your hands dirty you know you need to be able to understand i was talking to some of the national service personnel that you don't come to the industry and your target should be um, the computers or the mind planning and, and it's, it's similar to what I saw in, um, in Tanzania as well, you know. We have most of the mine planning. Nowadays, you don't get <coughs> mining engineers running operations, you know. Most of them are into planning. And therefore, we have more leading hands doing, um, who have risen up from driving trucks and uh, using doses coming through the ramp. But we should see more of the... Mine plan, uh, mining engineers going into operations, and that's one of the things that we're driving on this side. We want to make sure that the mine planning, the mining engineers that come are, are going into operations. We need them. We did something similar in Taka, 
you know, where we realized that all the guys that were were in the business that were mining engineers and running operations were all becoming old guys. All of us were interested in planning, planning, planning. And therefore, we had to deliberately bring in people that we trained them to go into the operational direction. I think it's very important that to become a mine manager, you should be able to run a shift yes. or an operation. Open pit is usually very flexible, but in underground is quite something that is enforced that you, you get that done and, and, and I think it's something that is we need to get our hands dirty, understand. Um, that also makes you a good leader because you're able to understand the, the, the challenges that the team gets when, when they go to the field and, and therefore prefer solution. And when they come to discuss things with you, you are able to appreciate it much better. Look, I think um, I must say that we've come far. I've seen the support of other um, people that came ahead of us. But I still think that our efforts around um, bringing up the young ones um, is it's something that um, all of us should show interest in <clears throat> because in the end they are the one going to take over the industry i need to come back to that point and that's why i appreciate the work that henry entry is doing okay henry entry uh, goes around supporting the young ones uh, it's something that i'm also um, trying to uh, do um, as well and i'm sure several others are doing similar things i think we need to do more and help the, the industry. The other thing is about the drive for me uh, regarding local content, you know. I, I want to see more mining uh, consulting firms that are coming up, taking up some of the consulting work that we're doing, you know. Um, very few mining consulting firms that <coughs> we've seen in, the, in Ghana I think we've come too far and we've had a lot of years of experience for us to be able to carry that weight yeah. of driving some of this consulting work for within the within the within the industry. So I want to see more of those happening. Um, and the other thing is research part, you know. The research um, is another place that I want to see more. Um, we're taking up research works that are going to impact most of the dynamics and the trends in the industry, whether I run mine planning, uh, new trends in mine planning, underground optimization, processing, geotech, and you know, all the value chain, you know. We, we, we have to be able to come up with a lot of um, work that is done within our institutions, that universities that are driving some of this um, um, research to help the industry. Yeah. Hey guys, we have a very interesting chat with Sam. Um, Sam, we always need to be thinking about the industry as an ability. Who is going to carry on after we are long gone? And for that matter, it's very important in the industry that we start religiously mentoring uh, our young professionals. They are the future. We need to spend a lot of time with them, bringing them up. Some of them, friends are wine has a lot of young professionals or early career in sciences, what you call them, a lot of student touches. And the wine initiative is that um, they push them to get a lot of experience time throughout the year. But there's even a new professional conference that they go to the high every day. They do come to the university school. Here they will hear about three or four times already. Yeah. But my question is, if you are addressing such things and the young professionals, what do you know now that you thought you should have known back then? That we have never thought. Look, um, one of the things that I really appreciated when I was in the industry 
is the is the power of data analysis. Okay, you know, um, I think I'm not sure during our time, um, and maybe now it has improved, but statistics was just done as one of the mass courses that you complete. Yeah, okay, course. there was no focus too much on the data analytics. No, the you know, the yeah, so it's just a start, you do all, you crunch all these numbers, but it application to the industry is something that we can close um, and the gap. Um, and, and talking about that, maybe um, things around bringing professionals from the industry, it does happen. If you go to most of the Kagoli School of Mines yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and some of the mining yeah. um, institutions, uh, universities, they usually bring industry guys to come and help them um, do most of those models and, 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 and close the gap between yeah. industry and, and academia. So um, I think there were things around how to engage in a much more robust data analysis, take a data and be able to understand the trends that are in and make a meaningful and informed information that is very relevant to decision making. Uh, I, those are some of the things that I, I, I learned um, once I was in the industry that I didn't really appreciate um, when I started. The economics, you know, uh, mining economics, it's, it borders around decision making um, as well. Yeah. Um, and then the, um, the key thing around working with people, okay? Um, how do we work with people? and so forth and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the key things that I think I would want to see um, that I think if I've gotten a good start about that and better appreciated those things would have probably taken me far in my in my career. Yes. And then um, you want to talk about monetization of the It's always been a storm every now and then. Goes, comes, goes, comes. Um, definitely there will be another storm. How do you think we should be um, positioning ourselves as industry, industry to embrace such changes to your Look, as for this, it will always happen. Always uh, I mean, every 10 to 12 years, we yes. see something like that happening. The issue has always been, and that's where those who are driving the concept of strategic mind planning, um, you know, most of the research work is showing about rare options, analysis. Yeah. Um, because what then happens is that we are always caught on the back foot. Okay. So when the gold price tanks, everybody is in the process of stripping cost. Okay. And therefore there's no investment going in. Um, and then by the time we all we stay, we see the gold price going up, which which is which is a balance in effect, you know, because equilibrium, as we all know in economics, once we were having the gold price going up, at a point it will come down for it to balance itself and go and go back again. So in that process, I, I think it's more about mine strategy, you know. Other mines have been more profitable when the gold price or they set themselves up for a raining day in the future. As an industry, I think we should be um, wary of the optimization of our cost, you know, um, because we know that as a certain cost profile, the there will be an equilibrium in this. Uh, there will be a balancing effect, and. And, and so we should all be watching the cost because that's, that's the main thing, competitive advantage, okay? And investors have become more sophisticated nowadays, you know, unlike in the past where they saying that give us the money, we know where to invest it, okay? <laughs> so if you don't come out with a much better value proposition for investors, he's saying pay me dividend and I'm going to, I know where to put my money. So the expectation from investors and other disruptions from other technology firms and other things 
is increasing every day that we need to stay competitive. And we are price takers, you know. We don't go bargaining for gold price. It is what the, the market says that. The only lever that we have in the gold mining industry, I mean, in, yes, yes. in the gold mining industry in this context, other commodities actually bargain for, yeah. um, uh, for, for commodity prices. The only lever we have in the gold industry is cost. Because the difference between company A and B, when a, an investor is making decisions, mostly will be about what margins are they creating. Yeah. And that margin goes to the cost. The lower your cost, the more margins you are creating, and therefore investors will be chase, chasing your stock. And if that happens, most of the time, the, um, the, the opportunity for investors to bring money to come and invest in this part of the world starts shrinking. Um, because there is this thing that is termed as country risk um, that always is against us. Um, as in the African um, industry, uh, African mining industry, um, which makes it very difficult for us to compete with capital with other projects in other parts of the world. So for us to sustain the industry, we need to always keep our focus on cost yeah, and, 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 and operate within our means. Yeah. If we do that, I think, um, and, and invest in research, okay, you know, because most mines that we taught in the past were not profitable, later on became, became profitable yeah. because there was new technology to deal with it. Okay. Um, when I was in Bogor, so all the sulfide that has been left there, okay, all the sulfide deposit in Bogor, so it's a matter of technology. Yeah. If we get a technology that can handle that, that mine springs back again, yeah. you know. So I think as an industry, we should partner with academia and, and, and provide some support to them for them to embark on serious research for us to come out with technologies that can help us become so efficient and competitive. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I'm looking at you, are, you are a very busy person. Um, during the problems has always been how we are able to balance our Look, uh, it's very difficult because I think for the past seven years I've been working as probably an expert and therefore doing this fly in, fly out. Um, and sometimes you clearly see that it has a toll on the children. Um, and so every opportunity that you get, you need to make, especially when I go on break, I need to and be able to make more time and, and have fun with them, you know. But by the time you realize, any time I've gone back home, I'm like, oh, the, the children are growing, you know. So by the time you realize they, 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 they are already in secondary school going to university and, you know, time it takes off already. And, and so I try to balance that um, by, you know, making time when there is time to, and, and I think we need to make time for the family. I keep on saying that the only support that you have, the real, real support you have is the family, okay? With the companies we work for, not that they don't care, but, um, you know, there is a extent to which they can be supporting, you know? Um, the family is the, is, the, is the bedrock of your support base. And therefore, um, we, need, we need to spend more time or allocate time for them. And once they understand our busy schedule, sometimes it's about the extent to which you go to make time for them that they appreciate, because they always know that you are busy. As I'm here, look at the time. By the time that I come out of meetings, my family is sleeping. Okay. By the time I'm going to bed, they are awake. So... They appreciate that, and therefore, if I make time within the course of my day to talk to them, eh, I'm sure they, they, that effort that I make, they appreciate that. And sometimes they also call me um, as well. So you have to balance it out. It can't just be all about work, 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 you know. 
you know, it, 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 if you work that way, you're going to crash yourself. So, talk about work for a how, how, what, what, what do you do? I mean, when you're not thinking about tons and days and then blessings and blessings. <laughs> well, tons and grades are maybe the, for me, it is an output rather than the the key thing for me is spending time with the team and trying to understand where they are and what support that I can provide for them because you see when you make people and their empowerment a priority tons and grade will come yeah. you see because I, I I can't go and work on the tons and grade no. you know I'm not a driver of those yeah, things yeah. <laughs> so the, the issue is do you really understand where your guy your, your team is and what support they need and and once you understand that and you are providing uh, that sort of leadership yeah. the tones and greed will come okay once a while you need to drive it when it's not coming true but what do you do you ask the question why why yeah. and i'm sure by now my team knows me i'm, I'm really fortunate that they haven't named me mr why because <laughs> i can ask in the question why okay so why and they are the same people that are going to come up with the well, solution yes. and the answers no, 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 you know no, 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 no. um and and where there is a need for coaching because of my exposure or experience i i come in yeah. but you let you got to let the people know that they are the key assets that we have um, and and you need to empower them to make decision i keep i tell my team that because I'm going to hold you accountable, I have to empower you to make a decision. Okay. Because you can't hold somebody accountable for which he has no authority over. Okay. So once we do that, we build the self confidence in people, tones and greed will come. And then, probably on the, on the soft side, what is it about you? What is it that you do now? When people get here, it's a surprise. What's it that I do? Yeah, that people don't know. <laughs> you don't play soccer. Yeah, I used to play soccer. In fact, I was a good soccer player. Um, but I'm a case of one, I had to choose between soccer and education. Uh, you know. And I see. Yeah. So. You know, in Accra, I had to. It got to that point where you have to make a decision. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. do you want to go? Because most of the time, remember, in those times, the 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 coast teams and other teams that you you play, they go to training around seven, yeah. early morning when you are supposed to be school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> seven and sometimes eight. You yeah, know, so you can see that uh, you can see the the that generation of players that we had it even in the national team most of them didn't go yeah. to school because that far there were no many academies academies yeah so you have to mostly make a choice between education and and um, playing yeah. soccer but i'm a, a real fan of soccer i play soccer and i do um i'm a pastor yeah. as well so m maybe that would be one of the things that will surprise people <laughs> That uh, you know, I'm a I'm a strong um, believer, and I practice my faith uh, as well. Look, I, I actually want us to uh, wrap up this chat. Uh, I focus on the strengths. I will want us to go back again over the years. What's actually been your major strength? I'm driven. That you want to share with yeah. Look, and then and, and probably as a follow up, um, what is that you want to tell the students, the young professionals, but most especially the colleagues and then the industry professionals I should say that will uh, push them to great heights. Yeah, for students I think look, if you get once you are in school uh, focus on your academics okay learn as much as you can and you know get the right grades because you probably will need it and um, for subsequent things that you might not know um, 
be inquisitive and ask questions to understand and don't just do things because this is how you are told to do it um, understand it because understanding something really brings about um, the ability to improve a system yes, yes. okay so I say that if you are someone who have taken over if that's a manager or superintendent that you've been doing the same thing all the time and you haven't improved it we need to ask questions so um, students should be inquisitive take their book serious um, and once they graduate and they come into the industry I don't know when you come into the industry be willing to learn okay don't have the thinking that because you got a certain grade and therefore you you don't have to learn something or you know it or be humble enough to learn and um, and and take it serious for colleagues that are already in the industry that are um, pushing I, I'll probably say that look really it is about do the self-confidence believe in yourself you know, I can't overemphasize that a lot. You know, believe in yourself. Um, have a plan for where you want to go. Because if you don't have a plan, people will make plan for you that doesn't really sit with you. Um, sometimes people are like, I'm waiting for this person to tell me what to do. It doesn't happen in this modern world. You know, um, so believe in yourself. Um, set goals for yourself and push it and ask questions as well you know if you don't know something be humble enough to ask the person who knows uh, sometimes in our industry and we we find it difficult to go and ask our subordinates um, things that they are good at that we don't know and and we feel that because we we graduated before them or we are their managers they can't know more than us okay um, if the person knows and you are struggling with that part, just go and ask. It doesn't change anything. Oh, you know, because management is not about you doing the job. Yeah. You see, that's one of the struggles that I had when I went to Australia because I come from an environment where a, you know you can't ask, you you have to do it and your thinking is that if you go and ask people are going to say, How can you call yourself an engineer and you don't know this? Okay. But sooner than later, I realized that's not how those people think. They, they are even like, oh, the guy has asked a question. Let's help the person. They don't think that way. So we need to change that sort of thinking to allow people to be able to find free and ask. But if you are in that sort of context and you are struggling with something, you don't understand it, and you also board need or somebody in the industry can help, there's nothing wrong with reaching out and say, hey, I've, I've heard that this, this, and that. Because some people might have exposure okay they've seen it somewhere else imagine you are working on a mine the same mine for 10 15 to 20 years all you've been doing is the same thing you know you probably will not be somebody that has worked in various places have moved around and has 10 years experience has seen a fair bit yes. than you have yes. so they might be of a help on what and that's why we talk about learnings learning from other minds so if the person comes from a place that has brought some learnings that you think can help we can be humble enough and, and ask that and you know i think if we do that and and add self-belief to it we will be able to achieve the the sort of milestones that we want to achieve in our career yeah that's okay if you still have like a close and personal chance if i try exciting one if some some probably is a Managing director from other scientific open mind. And some beliefs look as professionals, you need to have a plan, a work, a work plan. And that's, that starts from believing in yourself. You need to set goals for yourself, push all out, and there's a key to your task in all humility. Ask, ask, ask. If you will not set or you don't know anything, that will help us um, so, uh, my way back in the late 90s, you'll be shouting again, playing to make so much <laughs> Don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'm just trying to look back. Now, I mean, if you are given the opportunity again, a couple of times, would you, you, you still go for mining engineering? 
percent hands down. You know, uh, I I think that um, I think I believe that I was destined to do this. Okay, my name is Joy. Thank you, my name is Joy indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Yes.